Hello, and welcome to Radio Free Acton, the podcast of the Acton Institute dedicated to the study of religion and liberty. I'm Caroline Roberts, and on today's episode, you'll first be hearing a conversation between Acton's Associate Director of Program Outreach, Dan Churchwell, and Missy Wallace, who's the Executive Director of the Nashville Institute for Faith and Work. Dan and Missy discuss how Missy first became passionate about the connection of faith and work and why it's an important topic in business. After that, I'll be speaking with Brian A. Smith, who's the managing editor of Liberty Fund's Law and Liberty publication and the author of Walker Percy and the Politics of the Wayfarer, a look into the philosophy of the 20th century American writer Walker Percy. Brian and I discuss Percy's life and works, as well as his relevance today. If you're interested in any books, articles, or more referenced in the show today, you can find them all linked in our show notes, posted every Wednesday at blog.acton.org. My name is Dan Churchwell, Associate Director of Program Outreach here at the Acton Institute. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Missy Wallace, the founder and executive director of the Nashville Institute for Faith and Work. She'll be featured as one of the speakers at our upcoming one-day business conference on October 18th, titled Meaningful Work in a Modern Age. Missy, welcome to the Acton Podcast. Thank you. It's great to be with you all. We're absolutely looking forward to having you here in person next month. And uh, I first just just introduce our audience to, you know, tell us a little bit about your journey from corporate America. You have some really great experience there. Uh, to starting your own nonprofit, I, I believe in 2015, in this faith and work space. Give, give us a little of that journey. Mm-hmm. Thank you. It was a rather circuitous journey, I think, which often our journeys are, especially if we're trying to discern what God would have for us. And I think what's important to know is that a lot of my decision making. Um, early in my career, I was not trying to discern what God had for me. Um, yet, interestingly, looking back, he was guiding my steps nonetheless. So I do think it's interesting to see how our each of the paths we end up choosing um, he uses for, for his good work. And in Nashville, I started doing some individual consulting projects, and I took on one with a venture capitalist working on a media company. And he said, hey, I've got this other side project going on. And this side project um, has to do with a new school launching. And will you come just do a six-week project on this also? And I went and did that six-week project. And at the end of that, um, they offered me an opportunity to join full-time. And almost instantaneously, I said, yes, I'm in. I want to do this. And it did not make logical sense. If you looked at my career progression, if you looked at salary progression, if you looked at all these ways to measure things, it did not make sense. And what I now realize looking back retrospectively is part of why I said yes really quickly was I actually had bad theology about work. Um, At this point, Jesus was not in the trunk anymore, and I was struggling understanding how to think about profitable companies and market enterprises and faith and how those two came together. And I really didn't have a place to work through that. I would um, hear in the church pew, um, blessed are the meek. And I would go to work and think if I'm meek, I might might get fired. So I don't really know how to combine those two. And so I'm just not going to. Um, It wasn't that overt, but in retrospect, that was what was going on. And so I said yes to joining the nonprofit project, um, partially because of bad faith and work theology. I thought I was moving up in the hierarchy of God's work. So in my mind, I had artificially built a hierarchy that people of faith that were on the A team for God were ministers or missionaries. And then the B team, the nurses, the teachers, all the helping professions, the C team, everyone else except for the D team, which was you know, the venture capitalists, the corporate attorneys, the consultants. And I felt like I had spent a large part of my career on the D team. And in retrospect, that was that was bad theology. Um, however, it was an amazing experience. I'm very glad I said yes to the job. Um, fast forward a number of years, um, my oldest child became um, very sick with um, a disease that kept her out of school for a number of years. 
and I, she's fine now, by the way, she's thriving. Um, she's 20 now and doing quite well. And, but during that time I was out of work for three years while she was fighting this illness. And that was an enormous fork in the road for my faith journey. And I could no longer, Jesus had come out of the trunk, but now he was maybe hanging out in the back seat, leaning over into the front on my, um, you know, when I was in the mood, really, when I needed something. And with the fork in the road journey of my daughter's illness, suddenly this cruise control Christianity um, no longer worked. And I had to really come to terms with, did I believe what I said I believed or not? And so at that point, I um, did a dive in my faith journey, and I ended up in some graduate classes um, in a divinity school. I did not get the full degree. I did not finish. But I ended up in some graduate classes where I was exposed to um, the enormous and emerging body of faith and work literature. I felt um, a nudge that I, I needed to do something to get this word out in my city. Your organization, though, you mentioned an interesting piece. It, it's part of a cottage industry, uh, it seems, all throughout the country that are beginning to grapple with these faith and work tensions, um, kind of that uh, chaos or that um, profit-seeking. It sounded like you were struggling, you know, is that D team, you know, is, are the people that are making profits um, inherently evil, that, that tension. I mean, there are organizations in Chicago, in LA, um, I mean, all throughout the country that are, um, talking about these topics. What, why do you think there's such an emphasis right now or, 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 or such a burgeoning market, kind of a niche market on faith, work and economics in, in America today? Mm. That is a great question, and I am not sure I know the answer. Um, I maybe have a couple of hypotheses. Sure. Um, the obvious one is that God's timing does seem to work in kind of movements and chapters throughout history. I've learned from some wiser people than I am, and so clearly he, he may be behind this getting to somewhat of a tipping point in our country. But I think there's a couple of other things going on, too. I think it could with the baby boomers um, aging to a certain more introspective point where the n lot of natural introspection happens in life. That's such a large population um, segment. I think that what also could be happening is that the increased polarization in our country over the last decade or decade and a half, I think is causing people to stop and do some questioning and that could lead to questioning of their work. Um, there's two Gallup polls that put together show that something large is going on. Um, and one, Gallup has done a worldwide poll, and then the first version of it, which was released, I think, about three years ago, they found that what the whole wide world wants more than anything, and by whole wide world, they tried to question people from, you know, rural India to Wall Street and look for trends. And what the whole wide world wants more than anything is a good job. They found that a good job popped more than peace, love, security. And I'm sure good job means something different if you're in rural India than if you are on Wall Street. But it's still an incredibly meaningful finding as a global trend. But then at the exact same time, the U.S. shows that 80% of people through another Gallup poll are downright miserable to disengaged. And so those two data points make me think people want to think about their work. Yeah, and, and do you think, um, I mean, in, in your some of your interests and in, in your talking points in the past, you deal a lot with this, um, this idea of chaos and kind of bringing structure out of chaos. How, how has that helped you kind of center your thoughts on what you're doing there in Nashville? I don't think I really had a good understanding for a large part of my work that God actually created us to work. The Western mindset is um, everybody's working for the weekend, TGIF, work really hard so you can retire and enjoy yourself. And so the Western mindset is around working so you don't have to anymore. And so I don't think I understood work as what I was created to do. And in the very first chapter of the Bible, we see God doing his creative events. And each day he took very chaotic form and brought structure and called it good. 
did it five times, did it a sixth time and called it very good. And then said, we're in the image of God, which means, therefore, that's what we're supposed to do. And so if you start to think of work in that context, all work is bringing structure out of chaos and trying to call it good. It's very inspiring. I mean, if you're on a factory line, if you're changing diapers, if you're unloading a dishwasher, if you're doing an Excel spreadsheet, it's all taking chaos and trying to bring structure and trying to call it good. No, I love that. That's fascinating in, in thinking, uh, helping people think through some of the, the frustrations of just day-to-day work that, that, that core theme can bring a lot of, uh, understanding and, and helpful, um, anecdotes. And, and one of the anecdotes that I love that I heard you share before is, you know, tell me more about this entrepreneur support group that you help lead or, you know, are founding and working through. Tell, tell us a little bit about that specific program that you bring to the, to the Nashville community. That particular program, our entrepreneur support group, um, is a mustard seed of a program in our institute, yet seems to be having a lot of um, impact on the particular entrepreneur's lives. Basically, we are working with CEOs trying to help them um, reshape their thinking around their leadership so that rather than trying to tightly control the outcome, that they are leading with their hands a little wide open to what God would have for them, really trying to change the narrative from I am the bootstrapper, I have to get this done, to the narrative of this company is part of a larger unfolding story in God's narrative, and I've been given it to steward it, and how might I do that? And we're really trying to help um, entrepreneurs think more redemptively about their businesses, and we've used a lot of the Praxis lab materials to think about that and to be informed and to teach some of those concepts. And as we help them think more redemptively and more about stewardship of their companies, our hope is that they also become a little bit more um, emotionally and spiritually healthy in their leadership of their their companies. And what we found is that entrepreneurs have a pendulum that can really swing not just day to day, but even hour to hour of, oh my gosh, I'm in charge. I'm completely overwhelmed. This is not going well. I'm terrible at this to I am king, I am amazing, how am I going to do this again tomorrow? And and so they really go back and forth between I am not good enough to I am better than the other on a daily basis and kind of swinging from shame to pride. And we're trying to help them um, through the gospel view things in a bit more Christocentric way, which might help them stay a bit more level and healthy. So there, I mean, it seems like a lot of the, you know, this is an element of kind of behavioral economics and psychology and, and spiritual counseling and spiritual direction. I mean, it's kind of all wrapped up in one, isn't it? Because they're, they're dealing with their family lives, their business lives, and then they're being honest and open with this group. And, and so I, I bet that builds kind of a, a camaraderie, doesn't it? It does build an incredible camaraderie. And I believe that what they keep coming back for is the safe place to be authentic with um, the gospel narrative at the core. And so there are very few places that an entrepreneur can really gush what their biggest worries are. If they go home and mention it to their spouse, the spouse might say, oh my goodness, we have like bet the whole farm on this. Is this going to go down? If they go and mention it to their chief sales guy. The competitor might have been courting the chief sales guy. and Now suddenly the competitor uh, gets your chief sales guy. Then you're really going to go downhill. And so they end up incredibly isolated, caring a lot, and really confused between I'm the aspirational one. I've got the vision, but what is aspiration and what is reality? And how do I tell the difference and how do I not get confused between the two? Well, Missy, this is, uh, I mean, I've heard great things about your institute there in Nashville, and I know you have um, some great priorities headed into the future. So, so thank you for spending some time telling us a little bit about your amazing journey and, and what you're offering there. But we also are looking forward to hearing you speak right here in Grand Rapids on October 18th. So again, thank you for participating in, a, in our podcast today. Yes, I can't wait. It'll be my first trip to Grand Rapids. So thank you for the invitation. 
You see it in everything from political rhetoric to Hollywood films. Business is the bad guy. But is this really true? From the smallest mom and pop shop to the largest e-commerce storefronts, businesses are an essential pillar to a free and flourishing society. Without healthy, sustainable businesses, where would our society be? Join us at the Acton Institute in Grand Rapids on October 18 for a one-day conference where entrepreneurs and business leaders are brought together to explore the moral good that business does. Through panel discussions, interviews, and a luncheon, we'll look at topics such as the theological underpinnings of work, the meaning and dignity of work, and the role of the entrepreneur. Register at actin.org slash events. Walker Percy is known as one of the most important American writers of the 20th century. His first published book, The Moviegoer, won the National Book Award, and Time Magazine later named it as one of the 100 best English language novels from 1923 to 2005. Known for combining his Catholic faith with existential exploration, he remains one of the South's most beloved authors. Today, I'm joined by Brian A. Smith, who is the managing editor of Liberty Fund's Law and Liberty publication. He is also an avid fan of Walker Percy and has written much on Percy's philosophy, including the book Walker Percy in the Politics of the Wayfarer. I had the pleasure of meeting Brian at the Walker Percy Weekend Festival in St. Francis, Louisiana, not far actually from Walker Percy's last home in Covington. Brian, thank you for joining me on the show today. It's nice to speak with you again. It's nice to talk to you too, Caroline. Thanks for having me. I'd like to start off our conversation by diving into who Walker Percy is. He's a well-loved author, but... I would say there's still quite a number of people who've never heard of him. I probably wouldn't have heard of him either if I hadn't been an English major myself in college. Can you tell us where is he coming from as an author, how his worldview developed, and how it's perhaps influencing his writing? So Percy is often thought of as a Southern writer, but he hated that label. Uh, He thought of himself as a writer grappling with what it means to be human in the modern age. And he was raised well he was raised in the south um he was largely educated in science in new york city uh, at uh, columbia medical school and it was there that you know he got to pursue his love of science as a way of exploring all of human life but uh during world war 2 after uh, he had graduated and became a pathologist he contracted tuberculosis and in that time, there was no way of treating it. There were no antibiotics, so they sent you to a sanitarium. During his time there, he found himself consumed with questions about the meaning of life and turned to the reading of Kierkegaard, Dostoevsky, all the French and German existentialists. And that began uh, a journey for him of trying to understand man's place in the universe, which led him into the Catholic Church and caused him to embark on this quest to become a philosophical novelist, uh, for lack of a better description of what he was. Percy called himself an ex-suicide, referring to the fact that he was one of the longest living Percy relatives in a long line. His father and his grandfather, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that even his great-grandfather all committed suicide, so there's a history of depression in his family. Do you think that this family depression may have informed his existentialism? Absolutely. I mean, he, he said that one of the greatest mysteries of his life was uh, trying to answer the question, why did his father kill himself? The problem of suicide shows up over and over again across his writings. And I think for him, it becomes an invitation to bigger questions about the meaning of life. Because he, he ends up taking very seriously this problem of, if we are just matter in motion, if we are just sort of meaningless motes of dust, you know, the meaning of life becomes a, a real challenge. You know, ha, you can't sort of pin the story of yourself to any any greater story. You could say we 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 can pin it to history with a capital H, but but um, that only works if uh, what's that line? You know, history's arc bends toward justice. You know, for all time and 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 is irreversible. But I think for him, this idea of asking what it is that keeps people from committing suicide and sort of pressing on in life um, and and the things that lead them to suicide became really important for him. Also, I think as as a writer and thinker, because it shows up so often in his stories, you know, characters are always asking this – this sort of question of, well, if life is meaningless, why should I go on? 
This pressing on in life that you mentioned, I see a connection there with a Catholic understanding of living a sacramental life, basically seeing even mundane, everyday tasks as participation in a bigger picture. Did this come from his Catholic faith, or did he have this understanding before he converted? No, I I think that all came later through his conversion. I think he learned really well from Flannery O'Connor and many other writers that if you want to tell a story that might open people up to the possibility that the Christian message is true, you can't just beat them over the head with this story. You have to indirectly expose them to the things that make that make it that about that story that would make a difference in the way we actually go about living our lives. So he presents characters that are sort of lost in searching, muddling through the meaninglessness of their day-to-day existence. And it is usually sort of through the muddling through these things to the characters and, you know, through some one dramatic crisis or another, the characters become onto something more about existence and begin to see how it is that their ordinary, you know, Wednesday afternoons can have transcendent meaning. So I finished your book, Walker Percy in the Politics of the Wayfarer, about a month ago, and I really enjoyed it. But it's almost not really so much about politics um, in the way that we might understand it. At first, it may sound like you're writing on where Percy fell on the political spectrum, but really, I think it would be dangerous to present Percy as being only important to the right or the left, because he really wanted to be accessible to everyone. And I can hardly think of a single group of people, political or otherwise, that wasn't criticized by Percy. Um, What do you mean when you introduce Percy as a political thinker? So... I think Percy is one of the most important thinkers for us right now to consider as an antidote to the politics of our time. Um, what I meant by you know, referring to this idea of the politics of the wayfarer was that Percy presents us a philosophy for thinking differently about not just partisan politics, but how we relate as citizens to the political order. Uh, what What I think his essential insight is, is that we don't to the degree we become highly committed partisan actors, we don't tend to see the impermanence of politics. We forget that we're wayfarers um, on our way toward our final destination, and our, that our, our home is not this earth. And that should change the way that we engage with politics. Of course, we should love our neighbor. We should be deeply engaged. But we can't view, if we take Percy seriously, politics as the most important good of the universe. Um, we, we need to think first and foremost about our relationship to God and relationship to our fellow men. That's the insight that, that I, I took and tried to systematically draw out over the course of, I think it was five chapters uh, of his thinking. So this idea of wayfaring, Percy also wrote a lot on, you know, the idea of alienation, that man is a pilgrim, um, and a wayfarer, which is where you, of course, get your title, as you said. Where did Percy come up with this idea of alienation? And obviously, he's not the first one to do it, but why does he initially believe that we are alienated? For Percy, the most fundamental fact about our existence is that man can't ever be completely himself. So he he uses this example, which I I, I find helpful when I'm trying to define alienation. Um, I think it shows up in his novel, The Second Coming, of, you know, when a cat is sort of laying in the sun, the cat is 100% cat, no more, no less. It, you know, the, the cat is completely bound up with its bodily existence. And it, it's only reduced in its sort of catness, its its contentment when something scares it, when it feels pain. Um, and so in the novel, a shot rings out and the cat leaps up and, and you know, skitters away and is, is reduced to 0% contentment instantaneously. But for Percy, human beings are always more or less kind of lapsed away from ourselves in a way that we we can never be fully ourselves. You know, he, he says that it's it's rare for someone to be, you know, even half themselves, that the person, the average person on an average afternoon might be 3% themselves. <laughs> so the problem as, you know, you, you think of the way that 
many thinkers have described alienation. You know, for Marx, it was the fact that the products of our labor are, are not sort of brought to complete fruition and made a part of ourselves. And for a guy like Percy, that, that's way too simple. For him, it's not just that we're incapable of a complete communion with other people. We're not even fully in tune with and in communion with ourselves. And trying to get people to understand that this is a consequence of the fall, I think, was one of Percy's sort of peculiar quests, because he ne- he very rarely uses religious language to describe it. What would Percy have thought that the antidote to this feeling would have been? Because sometimes it seems in his writings that he thinks community will mask this feeling, but that doesn't seem fully sufficient. I think it's part of it. I mean, now, the, the, the ultimate antidote for, I think, any Christian has to be, um, you know, sort of the, the, the asking for grace and finding it. Um, but in the here and now, as we're wayfarers in this world, we absolutely need different kinds of community, the sort of closest community of family, uh, the one that we find in a church setting, and, and in the broader community of our neighborhoods, our politics, etc. cetera. Uh, because having the right relationship to all of those, though, is key, because just as C.S. Lewis understood – Percy is a really masterful diagnostician of all the ways that we can make idols out of one type of community or another, whether it's the community of the immediate family um, or that of our, our political parties. So as we're talking about modernism, community, and connectedness, I think that maybe not addressing technology would be a fault. So we see right now in the 21st century that increasingly this is happening or people are attempting to make it happen through abstract connections, through social media in particular, but that this might even make it worse, ironically. You know, staring at your phone after a while can actually feel isolating, even if you're talking to someone. And those social media connections most often feel fake. I really am grateful for technology, and I don't want to be this part of the show where we bash technology. Right. Um, it's helping a lot of people rise out of poverty, and I think it's safe to say that we all use it in most of our day-to-day tasks, probably in more ways than we even realize. But I can't help but think that Percy would have hated social media. So if Percy right. was alive today, what do you think he would have suggested to combat those feelings of disconnectedness? I think for Percy, the problem of social media is that it it makes it us able to connect with people that are very much like us, but very physically distant from ourselves. Or heck, I mean, it it, it allows us to communicate with people that are across the room from us, but in this sort of distance platform. The problem is none of these are face-to-face interactions with, with real people. So it makes it very easy for us to build bubbles around ourselves. When what Percy thinks we need is, is face-to-face talk with other people, all the messy complexity that comes from that, that, that you can't – I think one, one way to put this is you can't love your fellow man if what you're dealing with is an abstra- abstraction on a screen. It's all too easy for us to lapse into sort of categories of this is my ideological foe or – these are these are the wrong sort of people. So all of the the sort of worst, most sinful traits of human beings get brought out to the forefront in social media. When not that these are impossible to avoid in face to face interaction, it's just that when the person is right in front of you, it's a lot harder to sort of scream at them in all caps or to you know sort of evade the that the, the, the things we share. Uh, the, the both the flaws and and the and the virtues we share. I'm kind of curious as we're talking about these challenges that the 21st century presents to us, and every century presents challenges. And Percy explores this theme of modernism a lot in his books. And I'm curious, how do you think Percy would have defined modernism? Because I tend to think of modernism as really beliefs or trends relating to the time that someone is living in, but I'm not convinced that this is how Percy would have defined it. Most scholars, and I, and I think Percy read a lot of people that would define it this way, you know, tend to define modernism as a sort of pursuit of, you know, the the, the complete whole through reason and and rationality, and and so he's often accused of 
flirting too much with irrationality in his reaction against this. Like, so he reads all of these existentialists and, and some of the postmodern scholars um, and, and draws quite a, quite a bit from them. And these were all, all people who aimed at undercutting the modern pretension to complete knowledge or perfect designs. And, and I think much of his intellectual life was formed by his own personal rejection of that modernist ideal in science in particular. So he, he cautions people against, I think, both extremes. You know, we, we shouldn't be pursuing intellectual or architectural or pick your kind of perfection, but we also shouldn't throw out the idea that human beings can be reasonable. And this is what I take a lot of his works in the philosophy of language and in theorizing about the human person to be a reminder of that if human beings are completely irrational, you can't really explain some of the odd regularities in language that we have, some of the sort of peculiar ways that human beings strive toward order, although we never quite reach it. If you could recommend any one of Percy's books to someone who's never read him before, which one would you recommend? I, I mean, it, it, it is a hard question. I think a lot of people would say the his first novel, The Movie Goer. Um, but I'm very partial to uh, Lost in the Cosmos because it contains pieces of every part of Percy's thought. It has... Uh, it has speculative fiction. It has these comedic fictional moments where he presents these deranged scenarios to get us to think about things. But it also has a pretty compact set of summaries of his philosophy as a whole. And as a sort of one-stop point introduction to everything Percy is about and does and his mature thinking, I, I think it's hard to beat that one. Well, as always, Brian, thank you very much for your time today. I enjoyed speaking with you about Walker Percy, and somehow all of our conversations naturally float to Walker, so I look forward to the next time I speak with you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening today. If you want to learn more about the Acton Institute and what we do, visit our website at acton.org. Let your friends know that they can now listen to Radio Free Acton on their favorite podcast directory, as well as Spotify and YouTube. If you want to reach our podcast team here at Acton, you can leave us a message at 888-705-4180 or email us at rfa at acton.org. Let us know how you like Radio Free Acton and what you would like to hear more of. Lastly, if you like what you hear on this podcast, don't forget to give us a rating on iTunes. This episode is produced by me, Caroline Roberts, with audio mixing by Nathan Moore.